I am super excited to introduce this group of folks. This year, over 2,000 people applied for the LGBTQ Tech and Innovation Fellowship. About 150 people were selected. The group of folks met in May of this year in Washington, DC, and they got together to talk about social impact projects and how, as technologists, they could come together and move forward the mission of these social impact projects. So you're going to hear about healthcare. You're going to hear about eviction data heat mapping. You're going to hear about include IO. There's some amazing, amazing projects and work, and I'm not going to take any more time away from them. This is a volunteer project. They all have been working since May. This is the first time these concepts are seeing the light of day. It's super exciting. If you are excited about what you hear, please find these people after and get involved in the projects because they are doing some incredibly amazing things. The first project is from the Tegan and Sarah Foundation, and this is Team Sarah. Hi. Uh, so I'm Kristen, and I'm here on behalf of the Tegan and Sarah Foundation. This is a portion of Team Sarah. The rest of our amazing team is right here in the sixth row. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information, um, well, first of all, Tegan and Sarah wish that they could have been here. They're doing a photo shoot, so they are not here, but they send their love. Um, so the foundation is basically working for LGBTQ equality for girls and women, and the three pillars of our foundation are health, economic justice, and representation. So obviously, this fell under the health pillar. Um, so as you can see by this slide, uh, we like to frame it as there's a lot of opportunity to improve the current state of LGBTQ healthcare. Um, so just want to see a like, show of hands if you've ever had trouble finding a provider that meets your needs. That's actually better than I thought. But, <laughs> but OK, that's fair enough. And that's um, why we're doing what we're doing. And so this is our pilot. Thank you. So my name is Meg Nyman, and I'm on this team of 20 badass people that got together in Washington, D.C. about four months ago, and we've been working ever since. And so the first thing that we did was we did an online survey of the Tegan and Sarah audience. What we found out is that 50% of people are using really traditional means to find providers. The other 50% are using web searches. So we said, OK, well, is there more opportunity there? And so we did some one-on-one -on -one interviews. In the course of talking to these 14 patients and seven providers, we, pro we passed around these 10 different concepts that we came up with, basically to understand what are the unmet needs and where are the opportunity moments that we might be able to provide some sort of technical solution to help people get better access to healthcare. And then we also talked to four different organizations that are doing really amazing work in the space already. Uh, they tend to be somewhat fractured, but they're doing really incredible things. What we found was that it's a really hard problem. We originally thought it was a tech problem, but actually the databases are out there. It's an awareness problem. It's a problem that people don't know where to go, and they don't know how to get their needs met. And really, we found that the spirit of collaboration was going to help us through this process. So awareness is the biggest challenge, whether it's a provider who's going to do a Google search to understand how they can better serve a trans patient and coming up empty, or it's people who are going online and trying to find a, a qualified provider and not finding somebody in their area. They don't know where to find the databases that already exist that have these people. There's also a problem of funding because these databases are actually really hard to maintain. They require full-time staff, and most people are doing this on a shoestring budget from volunteers just like ourselves. And then there's a scale problem because these tend to be really focused on areas where they start. There's one based out of Philadelphia, so they're focused on Philadelphia. There's others around the country, but they tend to be on urban areas. They don't necessarily meet the entire country. And this quote really sort of sums up the problem, which is that Patients are eager to find a good provider. Providers are eager to help, but they don't necessarily have the resources, and we really need to team up in order to make a change. So how many people here have ever been to a product launch? Raise your hand. Well, put them up, everybody else, because you're at one today. <laughs> QueerHealthAccess.com is our pilot product for this for the Tegan and Sarah Foundation and for our initiative that all of us have been working so hard on together. So go to QueerHealthAccess.com. There you will find resources that we hope will be helpful to you today. Go engage with it. We, we link out to some of the um, experiences that... 
um, that Meg mentioned. Whatever. <laughs> I can do it. Um, and uh, so all of those, hopefully, it'll cover your geo. Value from it. Get value from it. Um, uh, educate yourself. Um, where they we have lists of like top ten things to do. With your There's some things that maybe you can print out to your healthcare provider so that they can provide better services to our community because on that side as well. Even with great intention, people don't use what questions to ask. Frankly, so set up um, some social accounts. Um, and we'd love for you to engage with us there. There's also a feedback form on the website. So again, we hope this, this pilot product that we're launching today will be helpful to you and help figure out how do we iterate from here. There are technical challenges. There's challenges with scaling trust. That's a big thing. If you work in this industry or you think you can help us with referrals to other directories that may be out there that we didn't come across, let us know. We, we really want to build this. Again, this is our pilot and we're going from here. And um, I'm going to end by making it rain queer health access. Oh, wait, come talk to us. We've got these shirts on, Tegan and Sarah Foundation. Everybody on this team is awesome. So you're going to want to talk to them and learn and engage. And here's some cards. Who's going next? I don't know who's next. Who's next? Team Tegan. Oh, Team Tegan. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Come on. <laughs> All right, I can't get our slides. All right, here we go. So show if you have or have had a mentor to guide your career or your life. Okay, cool. How many of you have had a mentor who looks like you? who is from the LGBTQ community or who understands what it's like to be queer in this world. That's what I thought. So we're here to change that. So we are Team Tegan. And you can see, we're gonna start off, we did a lot of research as to um, you know, what our demographic was and the statistics that we learned were pretty sobering. I'm not gonna go through all of these in detail, but the most important statistic is this last one, which is you have 100% commitment from Team Tegan going to build a mentor app that will allow you to connect with mentors who know what it's like to be queer in the world. So this is our portion of Team Tegan. Thank you. So we have Ryan, Raquel, Kristen, Rachel, Erica, and Amani, and I'm Karen. And we had a few other people with us in Washington, but this is the core team who's been involved since then and has been building the product. Thank you. So we started in May. We, we chose the name of our product as Mentor without the E. Um, we did a lot of research between now and then. No yeah, no men. Um, <laughs> and we've been working diligently on some wireframes and assessing our audience and how we want this application to work for all of you. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan, who's going to walk you through the design. This on the click. Oh, all right. Um, so we wanted to make sure the content that we put in this app made sense for our users. So our design team, we did a series of interviews, uh, surveys, etc., to make sure that the content was what y'all wanted. Oh, there we go. Ah, thank you, Raquel. Um, so the site itself. Um, as Karen was mentioning, it's made for people who pretty much aren't white dudes. Uh, there's not a lot of network out there for us, um, and we need to be able to move up in our careers or just personally. So when we get into the app here, first page, um, the content that you really want is seeing those people that can help mentor you. So immediately, that's what pops up there. And then once we get down here, we imagine this space is going to be filled with things like events happening in your area updates on what the Tegan and Sarah Foundation has been up to, um, and maybe some social media happenings as well. Then when we get over here to your personal profile, uh, you get to talk a little bit about yourself, because we all like doing that. And then um, we wanted to make sure users were able to implement social media that they already had available, so things like your LinkedIn, 
if you want to your Facebook or your Instagram, you can implement that into there so you can paint a better picture of yourself. Um, the other big thing we wanted to do, we found that face-to-face -face interactions are how people build empathy. Um, so you can either meet your mentor face-to-face -face in person, go out for a cup of coffee. It makes it really clear here when you're available or when they're available. And the other thing is you can do things like you can Skype in with them or have a Zoom meeting with them. Um, and we want you to be able to search mentors based off of whatever you're looking for. So maybe you're in engineering and you want to find another engineer, or maybe you're a woman of color and you want your mentor to be another woman of color. Maybe you're a trans person and you want your mentor to be another trans person because you have those shared experiences. You can look for that here. Um, and then we also have our handy dandy messaging system uh, where you can just chat with your mentor, maybe get feedback on your portfolio, et cetera. Um, so, Right now, we have a prototype, an Envision prototype, and we really want people to test it out. So if you see me or any of my awesome team, uh, bug them and test out our prototype, because this won't work without y'all. What? <laughs> I like it. Nerdy jokes. <laughs> um, up next, we're going to really iterate on the branding, on the design, um, and on the development end. And then hopefully this time next year, we are going to have a full-fledged app, y'all, and we want you to be a part of it. So go to mentor.org. As Raquel said, no men. Uh, so mentor without the E, but obviously dudes are invited. Um, hashtag safer space. Um, but yeah, so go check it out. We want y'all to be a part of this because it can't work without you. So thank you so much, and thank you to the Tegan and Sarah Foundation. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Steph Barak, and <laughs> um, I work at Bain & Company as a team leader in our people management uh, systems department, but I'm going to talk to you pretty quickly about the work we were able to complete over the last few months with Think of Us. So to give you a little bit of uh, context, um, there are over 100,000 youth in foster care that are not returning home or getting adopted. Uh, these youth will turn 18 or 21 and have to be ready to take care of themselves with little to no support system. Um, Think of us as a nonprofit that is working to develop an online life coaching platform that helps youth navigate their transition into adulthood. And the tool allows youth to do things like create goals, uh, work on goals with supportive adults, send their goals to their social worker, connect to resources, and lastly, develop and maintain a personal budget. Um, and that last point is where we really helped uh, the Think of Us team. So quickly to let you know what we accomplished over the last few months, we really spent that time focusing on the planning and design uh, and the logic that would uh, support the, the budget tool. So what we did was defined budget categories, so how much percent of your income should you be saving, uh, spending on expenses, et cetera. We recommended a structure to handle future cost of living adjustments. We're in New York right now, and so we know the, the uh, percentages can differ if you live in a city versus uh, um, more a, a suburban area. We outlined the logic for the AI chatbot responses, so the tool is actually based on AI, so the youth can go in and feel like they're talking to somebody as they build their budget. And finally, we identified some potential integration points that would surface resources to youth who are maybe having trouble uh, meeting their, bu their budget. Here's a quick mock-up of what the Think of Us team uh, designed based on the logic that we put together. Uh, so you can see kind of how the chatbot uh, would work with the youth uh, to put together their budget. And what we want to keep working on is actually help Think of Us write the code to support the, the chatbot, and lastly, help them test the, uh, the budget portion of the tool. Thanks. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Natarajan Krishnaswamy, and this is Melanie Pang, and we're here on behalf of Team Eviction Ant. Yeah. So my name is Melanie Tormina Pang. Um, I'm a social worker. Um, <laughs> I'm a queer Asian American woman, and I work for Salvation Army, and if that confuses you, come find me at the conference and ask me how. Um, so I 
I was born in Houston, I live in Houston, and I love Houston. Um, it is the number one refugee hub in the country. It is the birthplace of Beyonce. <laughs> yes. And currently, demographically, we are where the rest of the country is estimated to be in 2050. So I am literally here from the future. Um, you can move forward if you want to. Or actually, let me just grab that from you. Thanks. <laughs> He's always helping me out. So, <laughs> uh, locals hate this phrase, but we'll go with it. Houston has a problem. Um, we experience eviction, similar to how a lot of other large cities experience it, which is that the landscape is changing, that the people who are moving in are different from the people who have always lived there, and we don't fully understand that problem just yet. Um, as you can see from the past few days and your news feed, um, Houston has been through a lot. And this isn't the first time. Uh, we've experienced floods, we've experienced a lot of devastating uh, natural disasters before, and something that I've noticed that happens right after quite quickly is eviction. So just to give you some scale, um, if there are about 2,000 attendees here today, that would mean that about 80 of you will have experienced eviction, 80 of you in this room will have experienced eviction in the past five years. Another layer to that, uh, another challenge to that, is our, our city is massive. Um, our Harris County, which uh, the city of Houston is located in, is, <laughs> somebody just like went like this, um, Rhode Island could fit inside of it. So just to give you some scale of how spread out we all are. And it's certainly not a new problem, right? We're, we're needing to learn about this, but the only way to learn about eviction is to download it in one month chunks in spreadsheets that are hard to read. And who would do that other than me? <laughs> so enter eviction in Houston, um, <laughs> our solution. So I'm gonna let Natarajan explain that a little more in depth. So the big idea is we wanted to actually download this data, the evictions from the courts, and also uh, covariates that were interesting, and try to figure out what we could uh, learn from that to make eviction uh, resources more easily available and more effectively distributed. Um, and so that's what we did. <laughs> Uh, after that, like most of our work was through the visualization, and we mapped the areas with high eviction rates, where uh, things fit into neighborhoods, how things change over time, and where each individual eviction gets uh, plotted on uh, a map. And we made some key insights, namely that summer is the most, uh, the heaviest time for eviction, and that, oops, yes. Oh, sorry. So. Uh, thanks. I'm being really pushy right now. So uh, this graph shows you 10 years worth of flood data, right? And this big old oh, eviction data, excuse me. Um, and this big old spike right here, can you guess what it might have been? Hurricane Ike. So shortly after, uh, Hurricane Ike happened in September, and very shortly after, in October, you can see that there was a tremendous increase in, in eviction. And so if we know that that's happening after every de devastating flood, um, we should be preparing for the amount of affordable housing that we need in the area. Sorry, I just love Houston so much. Okay, back. <laughs> well, certainly. So this, this chart just shows areas where uh, we consistently have uh, evictions. So this is how often an area is in the top 10%. And many of these areas, the darkest red, have been in the top 10 for over a decade. So, so uh, we also found, based on the analysis of census data, that the marginalized communities are, as we would expect, uh, the most at risk. Uh, so to share this, we made a website, evictionand.org. Uh, so I'm getting the like the cane, the like da 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 da. So um, so what what can we do about this everywhere, right? So don't you want to know what's happening in your neighborhood before it happens to your neighborhood? Um, so we want to expand this. So if you're interested in helping us build this out in other cities um, or even expand it in Houston, please find us. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of obviously lots of possibilities for this, and San Francisco has a has a map itself. You can check it out as a eviction map, I think. Um, and so find us on Twitter. Tweet at us, tell us what a sweet project we have and that you would like to join us. And you can also send us an email. And I just want to say thank you so much for all the support that, that this conference has lent to Houston. I know it means the world to everyone there. So thank you so much for shining a light and uh, keep thinking about those in Florida and 
and basically all over the world <laughs> that are experiencing trouble. So thank you very much. Some good shit. You guys just heard some good stuff. Um, well, thanks. My name's Laura, and um, I'm part of the Include.io team, and some of our lovely teammates are right here. Um, we're really excited to share with you a little bit more about what we worked on for the last several months. Um, how many of you have heard of Include.io, or you've seen the platform as it stands right now? Yeah, awesome. Well, hopefully, all of those hands will be raised here pretty soon. But um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. And instead of talking, I think we might uh, share a video. So I'll have Tarion to talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Um, so leveraging the talent in our team um, and my media production company, we created a video that will give you an insight about Include.io. And if you have more questions, chat with us later. Hi, my name is Evelyn. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am. Let me start over. Hi, my name's Evelyn. Hi, my name is Evelyn. Very excited to share my experience with you and I, I would like a job here or some employment. Hi, I'm Evelyn. I'm here to talk to you about me. Hi, I'm Evelyn. I have eight years experience or was that seven? Oh, can I start over? Being a queer middle-aged woman of color is not easy in this job market to find a company that's looking for someone just like me. On the Include platform, I can show off my skills and get in front of the right people and find my dream job. So after building my profile, I was able to be matched with a mentor who gave me great feedback on my resume. If you're an employer, a mentor, or someone looking for a meaningful career, let's build a more diverse and inclusive team together. Today we're gonna get our dream job. How did I do? 